repentance from a biblical standpoint. What is repentance? And we know in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, it says that one of the foundational beliefs of the new covenant is repentance from dead works to faith in God. We talked also about that repentance doesn't necessarily just mean that you run forward in an altar call, cry, you know, take out your cigarettes or what it is, ever it is that you feel is keeping you from God, throw it up there and then determine to be a good person after that. Now that's the fruit of repentance because we need to live a righteous and holy life. Amen? Amen? God doesn't want a bunch of idiots and hypocrites running around the church. But the thing is, is the church, we've got it all backwards. We preach straighten out your life and then God will love you, not God loves you. And when you yield to his love, your life is going to change radically. We change, we talk about behavior modification and change. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're called to change the world. I, don't, I haven't found it in Scripture. It doesn't say we're supposed to change the world. It says we're supposed to love the world. And when we love the world with the love that God has shown us, then we'll bring transformation. If all we're doing is changing a person but don't deal with the heart, then we've missed the whole purpose of Christ. So repentance, it says, it's repentance from dead works to faith in God. Now, many times, and I've seen it over and over again, having been around the grace message for many years now, preached it, taught it, when people begin to get a revelation of grace and being set free from the law, they make this big switch into lawlessness. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. You don't know my heart. I can live the way I want. God loves me just the way I am. It's true. God loves us the way we are, right? He loves us. But you really don't love him if you're not allowing that love to change your heart. Amen? The thing I've discovered is that it's repentance from to. If all you do is turn from something, you're probably going to turn right back to it. That's why Paul said it's repentance from dead works to faith in God. We turn away from our dead religious system of trying to be right with God, and we embrace this new covenant relationship of faith and grace and being led by the Spirit of God. Amen? Letting the Spirit of God. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of grace, and grace is God's ability. It's His empowerment working within us to bring transformation and change. It's not just a get out of hell free card, but it's an empowerment to live the life that God has called and wants us to live. Now, some of this I'm recapping from a few weeks ago. You might want to get online the app that Angie put together, um, Faith Ministries app, and you can read a lot, or you can listen to the message I preached as long as well as all the other ones. So, some of this is a recap. But how many of you guys remember that when John the Baptist came on the scene in uh, Matthew 3, verse 1? He had a very specific message. Does anyone remember what that message was? He said, repent. There it is. Thanks, Karen. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, most of my Christian life, actually, it's about half of it now because I've been living in the grace for actually over half now, praise God. But my perspective was that you got to get rid of your sin, change your heart, because God's kingdom's coming. But really, what John was doing is he was preaching to a group of very religious, committed Jews that they were going to have to change their perspective to see the kingdom of God that was about ready to show up. And it showed up in a person named Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is not just a fairy tale that's going to come in the hereafter. It's not just when Jesus comes and sets up his rule and reign. That will be the culmination of the fulfillment, but the kingdom came in Jesus. The rule and reign of God came through Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, and now we can say that we're living in the kingdom. How many of you guys are living in the kingdom? It's amazing to think that an ambassador, let's say you're an ambassador of the, the, the country of Holland and you, you go to Iran, you actually are, you are carrying a piece of your kingdom, the kingdom of Holland, to the country of Iran because you are in the kingdom. Therefore, where you go, the kingdom goes. You have certain rights and privileges as a citizen of Holland, even though you're in another country. That's the way God wants us to operate. We're in the kingdom now. The kingdom of God is advancing now, but he's doing it through us. 
This also goes along with uh, Matthew chapter, I think it's 17. Let me pull it up here. Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Jesus, let's go ahead and put, if we can pull that up, Karen. Matthew 17, 20 and 21. Might not have it, but you'll remember this. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, when is the kingdom of heaven um, going to show up? basically. And Jesus looked at him and he said, the kingdom of God does not come by your careful observance. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. How many of you remember that? Now, I, I used to think observance, observance, by focusing, by thinking, by, by putting the, the focus on, it's not going to come that way. But really, that word observance, if you look it up in the New Testament, Almost every time it's used, it's talking about observance to the old covenant law. Interesting, huh? So he's saying the kingdom of God is not, because, it's not coming because you observe a bunch of rules and regulations. The kingdom of God is within you. Now remember, we're talking about a kingdom of God's grace. The kingdom is not a, a kingdom of lawlessness. It's a kingdom of grace. The governor is the Holy Spirit. The constitution of the kingdom is the new covenant. Are you guys getting this? So we've got we've to really understand the way our kingdom, the rule and reign of God in our midst and within us works. Because most Christians, they believe that the kingdom functions with a little bit of law and a little bit of grace. Most people carry the law of God into their relationship with God, and therefore they live defeated lives. Because as long as you're focused on you and what you need to do, you're not going to be open and available to the kingdom of God flowing through you. Amen? You guys must be tired. I'm getting myself excited. You know, another thing we talked about this is important, is that in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law to fulfill it. Do you remember talking about that? Now, this is key because the law of God is good. And by law, I'm talking about the Old Testament um, requirements and law of God that he prescribed, specifically the Ten Commandments. He gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 10. And then the rest of uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy, it's, there's 630 laws, basically how to interpret those Ten Commandments. Don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery, honor your father and your mother, shall have another gods before you. So God gave 10 laws, and then he interpreted it in 630 plus ways. And then Jesus came on the scene, and he boiled it down to two things. What were they? Love the Lord your God, and he was quoting from the Old, Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he took another one from Leviticus, which said, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he brought it down to two things. Now, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I got this little bit of information from Jim Richards last week, but it was really helpful. But he said that in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had added on over 2,000 other laws or interpretations to those 630 plus laws that were already there. Now, that's a lot of laws, isn't it? That's a lot of do's. And the, the crazy thing about this is if you, didn't do, if you didn't do them all, you weren't qualified for the blessings of God. Now, God had a system in place that pointed to Jesus, and that system was the sacrificial system. And the sacrificial system you would bring a goat or you would bring a sheep and the, and the priest would examine that sheep to see if it was perfect and then there would be a sacrifice and the blood would be poured out and that would cover your sin until you did it again. Unfortunately with human beings is we can't live a perfect life and we can't live up to God's requirements of us. Amen? And the reason God gave the law was to make it clear that in and of ourselves, we could never be righteous before God. People have tried and done it, and therefore Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds or surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees and Sadducees, you won't even get into the kingdom of God. Because the only way of being right with God is what way? Faith in Jesus Christ. This is the very heart of the gospel. Adam messed it up, and Jesus set things right. 
In Adam, we all are made sinners in Jesus Christ. Everyone who puts faith in Jesus is made righteous. It's the great exchange. I want to look at a few scriptures here. Is this making sense to you guys? Romans 10, verse 4. Do you have that one? It says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe. Now, end means the culmination or the fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. So as a new covenant Christian, you're not under law. You don't need to be going back to the law to figure out the way, what God wants you to do and the way he wants you to be. I made a statement a few weeks back that the law actually brings a revival of sin. We've got it all backwards. Preachers try to preach hard on sin and righteousness and judgment and holiness because we want to clean people up. Now, the motive is pure. We want people to, to really start living for God. But we've got it all backwards because doing that, you actually, according to Paul, you bring a revival of sin. Paul said, I didn't even know what sin was until the commandment came. The law is the consciousness of sin. It makes us conscious of sin. And when I'm conscious on my, of myself and my own shortcomings, I'm not conscious of Jesus Christ and what he did for me. And that, my friends, I believe is the biggest hindrance that most Christians have to living the abundant life that God has for us, is we become so focused on the rules and the regulations. Now, you can take the new covenant and you can make it into a bunch of rules too. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? You can take... You can take the New Testament and you can pull all of Paul's rules out and say, yeah, this is it. You can't cut your hair. Women are not allowed to talk in church. This, this, and this. But the whole thing is God wants a relationship. The whole point of the new covenant of, of grace is to bring us into a relationship with God. Say relationship. So everything we hear about grace and the new covenant. It needs to be bringing us into a relationship with God. And this is something I appreciate so much about Jim Richards, who's been just a blessing to me and my, my wife with his teaching, is that he makes it so clear that it's all about having a relationship. Some of the most harsh Christians I've, I've met have been grace Christians. And you ever met some of those? They're like the grace police. And they've got all the right answers, but they really don't understand the heart of God. Man, sometimes I'll post something on Facebook and I'll get the, the Reformed Calvinists just debating me. And then I'll get a bunch of grace people debating me. It's like, man, you can't please anyone. But it's all about a relationship, guys. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It's all about everything in the Old Testament and everything is pointing to everything in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus and everything in the New Testament after the cross is pointing back to that moment on the cross where God forgave our sins and made us righteous. So it's all about having a relationship with God. It's all about knowing the heart of God, experiencing the heart of God. And what I've discovered is that when I really yield to God's grace, when I began to discover how valuable I am to God, the price he paid, this free gift of righteousness that I ended up really living for God, but I wasn't even trying to do it. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? It's like when you really understand your identity, you're living out of your identity. You're living out of who you are. And unfortunately, most Christians don't know who they are. They're trying to become something. They're trying to become, yeah, that verbally they acknowledge I am a new creation, but they really don't believe it. They're doing things to try to become a new creation, to be forgiven. And they're just in this, this hamster wheel of performance. I remember I was, uh, years ago, I was at the gym working out, and it, it's been years since I worked out at the gym, actually down here in Grandview. And I remember I was just sitting, or, or not sitting, but I was running on the treadmill. I think Hoochie was with me. And we're just having a conversation, just going kind of slow. And this, this big African-American dude comes in and he's all, he's all ripped and buff. And he's got, you know, all his workout clothes and he's got his headphones on and he's, he's working out and he's going really, really fast. And next thing I know, he, I don't know if he, he caught his attention, a girl walked by or something, but he turned his head and he lost his step and went down. <laughs> He got going so fast on the hamster wheel that, man, he, it took him down. And unfortunately, too many Christians, too many Christians are living like that with God. They're in this performance trap. But what I've found is that I've done so much more for God through grace than I ever did through trying to be a good Christian because he changed my heart. He changed my motive. 
I wasn't just turning from something, I was turning to. I was turning from dead works, but I was turning to a relationship with the living God and knowing that I can come freely into Papa's presence and experience all who he is, his great love, that there's nothing left in the world to separate me from him. What did Adam and Eve do when they ate the fruit? They hid. They were ashamed. They sewed fig leaves together. They tried to cover themselves with an apron. The terrible thing about an apron is it only covers the front. What happens when you turn around? (laughs) Keep it clean, Bonhams. I know your style. That's what religion does. It puts a good view of the front, but it doesn't change your backside. You're just as ugly as ever. Man, it is the grace of God that transforms. Give Jesus a big round of applause. Come on. (laughs) Glad we don't have to be religious. Come on. Karen, do you have Hebrews 7, 18, and 19? I had it in the Amplified. There you go. Now, the book of Hebrews, it's... It's a letter that most likely Paul wrote to Jewish Christians that were on the verge of going back under a religious system in their relationship with God. So it was all focused on getting getting their perspective correct on Christ and His finished work. And so there's some strong statements. And this is one in, uh, in Hebrews 7, 18 and 19. It says, on the one hand, the former commandment, and he's talking about the old covenant system of law. He's saying, the former commandment is canceled because of its weakness and uselessness because of its inability to justify the sinner before God. So God canceled out the old covenant way of getting to God because it was weak and useless because it couldn't justify us. Verse 19 says, the law never made anything perfect. Now stop there. The law is not bad. The law is good. It's holy, just, and good. So we're not lawless. The law is, the law is from God. But the thing is, there was a problem with us, and we couldn't meet God's law. And so what happened is the law was put into place to lead us to Christ, Paul said. It's like if, you, if you're working outside and you go into the bathroom, you look in the mirror, it shows you the dirt all over your face, but you'd be an idiot if you took the mirror off and started to scrub your face with it. The law is a mirror, is what James says. It reveals our sins, but it can't cleanse us. So when you look into the law, what it should do is it should drive you to Jesus. If you're already born again, you should say, oh, I thank you, God, that I am a new creation. I thank you, God, that you took away all my sin. I thank you that I am justified, sanctified, and righteous. That's what the law should do. Thank you, God, I'm not under law. If you're a self-righteous person, seeing the law should make you cry out, oh, God, have mercy on me. I go to Jesus You don't take the the mirror off and scrub your face. You go to the water and you wash your filth away. You wash, go to the blood of Jesus Christ. So it says, the law never made anything perfect, while on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near continually to God. Now, what is that better hope? It's the hope of the new covenant, the hope of grace, the hope of God's finished work. And that causes us to continually draw near to God. We live in a better covenant. Amen? Now, this is what the law did, and I'm going to need an example. I'm going to need someone to help me here. Why don't you come on up here, Dan? You were looking away. You know I was looking for someone, and you're like, (laughs) do-do-do. And do you have Romans 8, 3 to 4 in the, the message translation? It should have been in the notes. Romans 8, 3 and 4. Romans 8, man, what an amazing thing. It's uh, Romans 8, 3 to 4. I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and read it, and if, if we can find it, we'll pull it up. But it got, says, God, actually, first let me read a little bit of it in the New King James. It says, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On the account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Do you guys get that? So what the law could not do because we were weak in the flesh, God did. How many of you are glad that God did it? And then it says that Jesus came in the likeness of a person of, the, of sinful flesh, though he never sinned. 
because of sin, and he condemns sin, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. So Jesus met all the requirements of the law. He perfectly fulfilled every law of God in the old covenant. And he didn't just do it externally. His motives were pure. Jesus said, if you have, uh, you know, if you say to your brother, you're a fool, you're an idiot, or you hate someone, you're guilty of murder. That's what he, so Jesus raised the standard so high that the only way we're going to get into the kingdom is by grace. And so this is what it says in Romans 8, 3 and 4. And then we're going to use you. It says, God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The, uh, the law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of the deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for but we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit of God is doing for us. So it says that the law always ended up as being a band-aid. So we're going we're to do a little experiment here. According to Eugene Peterson in the message translation, he says that the law system is a band-aid. Now, I have a six-year-old little girl, and whenever she cuts herself outside, she thinks that a band-aid is going to make it all better. And I try to sit down and say, sweetie, the band-aid doesn't help. If you sleep with the band-aid on, it's probably going to do worse because it's going to keep the thing, the cut from drying up. But she just won't get that. Most Christians, they think, they, they, when it comes to a problem, they just put a Band-Aid on it. And that's what the Bible's saying, the law is a Band-Aid, a system of right and wrong. Whenever you have the law preached and you're embracing the law, thinking you've got uh, you've to keep a system for God to love and accept you, it's like putting a Band-Aid on the problem. If you don't tithe, God's going to be angry and upset with you, and he's probably going to take out your dishwasher. We're putting a da- Band-Aid on the problem. So we, we pull out our 10% and we give it to church, but we haven't dealt with our heart. We're operating out of fear, and it's called a Band-Aid. And the thing is, we hear a little law, and we go back, and we... Well, by the way, these are Moana Band-Aids. No, actually, there's something else. I'm not sure who this one is. But we keep going back and we're hearing the same things. If you want your prayers to be answered, you've got to live holy because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. How many of you have heard that one? Now, how holy is holy enough? Let me ask you. If without holiness, you're not going to see the Lord. Now, I'm guilty of using this verse out of context. Now, holiness just means the state of being set apart. And in Jesus Christ, you are holy and you are set apart once for all through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, I I believe we've got to live holy, but it's the fruit and not the root. It comes out of an overflow of our heart when your heart's been changed by the love of God. But too often, we get these messages, got to live holy, man, or God's going to spew you out of his mouth if you're lukewarm. And so we get it good for a little while. We put a Band-Aid on it. But the thing is, we haven't changed our heart, right? And it just, foc- it just causes us to focus more and more on law. And, and we could go on and on and on. But most Christians, what we're doing is we're just combining law and grace. And so we end up looking like this. We're putting a Band-Aid on it, but we haven't dealt with the heart. We haven't changed the motives. We're not living out of who we really are. But when we get the message of God's grace and love, you know what it does? It reveals what's underneath. And sometimes it hurts, doesn't it? (laughs) You didn't shave very well today, did you? Grace, I'll be gentler. It reveals... All the ugliness, doesn't it? (laughs) You can take a seat. (laughs) And so often the accusation of those that preach the grace of God is, man, look at this person. He listened to what 
you were preaching, and now he's back living a life of sin. And the thing is, is that grace doesn't cause you to sin. It just reveals what was already there in your heart. If you wanted to sin, you were going to do it either way. And the law was just, it was just, it was just giving you a confined way of doing it pretty much. And so what grace does and what the new covenant does is it reveals who we really are so that we can allow the love and the grace and the peace of God to come in and transform us. It brings a change in here, not just out here. And it puts us in a place where we can receive healing. Because what happens if all we do is put a Band-Aid on it is the wound oftentimes just festers and gets nasty and infection grows. But yet, we're still trying to keep it covered up. But when we can really grasp this new covenant of God's grace and mercy and come to God the way we are, not the way we think we should be, then we put our play, ourselves in a place where God can go to work and God can change us and God can heal us. What I found is that it's in an atmosphere of unconditional love and, and acceptance where people can get set free and change. Anyone in here a re, in a recovery program or I know, I know you've been through it about 30 years ago. But the thing is, is you got to come to a place where you're very real with the problem and you, uh, you open up. You're not trying to put a Band-Aid on it. You're allowing the healing power of God to come in and transform your life. You're beginning to renew your mind to the truth of what the Word of God says. And it's not, it's, and when you begin to renew your mind, here's, here's the goal of all teaching in the Bible is that it would go from here to here. Because if all it is is in here, then that's just more information. My wife and I were just talking about this this morning. It's not just about getting more information. It's about getting that information that's up here, in here, where it can begin to really change and transform. So when Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, he was saying that your mind's the processor. And as you allow your mind to be renewed, it's going to begin to transform in here because Jesus said, out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaks. So as you allow the truth of God to transform the way you think, it's really affecting your heart. And that's going to affect your living. And you're going to begin to live in a way that glorifies and honors God. You're going to begin to live out of the new covenant of grace and the truth of the finished work of the cross. Amen? Is this helping anyone today? In just a minute, we're going to, we're going to take up, uh, we're going to do communion. We're going to, but we're going to do it in a different way. And I really believe that God wants to do some exciting things in people today. But before we do that, I want, I want to look at one more example from Scripture of the New Testament or the New Covenant way. Because the new covenant is not an addendum to the old covenant. Do you guys understand that? It's a brand new way. It's a new way. Jesus fulfilled the law so he could bring in a brand new way. You're not adding Jesus to the old way. You're allowing him to do something brand new. And the old covenant was all about us and what we had to do to measure up. And you see that in thou shalt not Da, da, da. Thou shalt not this. Thou shalt not this. But in the new covenant, when Jeremiah prophesied in chapter 31, he said, a time is coming where I will make a new covenant. It'll not be like the old covenant. It'll be new. And it says, I will forgive their sins. I will do this. I will do that. So the Old Testament was all about your will. The New Testament's always about God's will for you and allowing that will to work through you. The Old Testament was all about thou shalt not. The New Testament, the New Covenant is all about God. I will do this for you. And the beautiful thing is you enter into it by trusting in Jesus Christ. When Jesus hung on the cross, you hung on the cross. When Jesus was taken down and put into the grave, your old life was taken down and put into the grave. When Jesus rose from the dead, you rose from the dead. You were in Christ, is what Paul said. And that will bring change. That will bring transformation. In the Old Testament, it was all about achieving to enter in. In the New Covenant, it's all, all about receiving. It's not about achieving, it's about receiving. And so I want to look at one more story in the Bible, and then we're going to do communion. How many of you guys remember the story of uh, Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19? Let me go ahead and, and look at that. If you can pull that up, Karen. Now, this is a beautiful picture of grace. The chapter before that, there is a picture, picture perfect of the law way. 
and you can go ahead and read this on uh, read it later on. Chapter 18 that talks about the rich young ruler. How many of you guys remember about the rich young ruler? And this guy came to Jesus, and his question was in Luke 18, what good thing must I do? If you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers, right? Wrong question, what must I do to attain eternal life? And so Jesus gave him the answer. If you're looking at doing the right stuff to attain, attain eternal life, then he said, you know the commands. Thou shalt not lie, cheat, steal, commit adultery. The man says, Lord... I've done all these things ever since I was, I was a young man. What do I still lack? If you're going after God through a system of laws, you're always going to lack one thing. If you're trying to earn your righteousness, there's always going to be one more thing, one more hoop to jump through, one more thing you've got to do. And so Jesus gave him what he asked for. He said, sell all that you have, give to the poor and come and follow me. Basically, he was dealing with the covetousness of that young man. Thou shalt not covet. Now, that was the law way, and that man went away sad, broken. The law always, it always, you never measure up when you're going after God through a system of right and wrong, rules and regulations. You never measure up. There's always one thing that you still need to do to obtain it. One more thing you've got to do to get breakthrough. One more thing you've got to confess. One more thing you've got to read. But let's look at Jesus' way. And in Luke chapter 19, verse 1, and if we can pull up the, uh, the actual verse if we can, there's a story about Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a sinner. He was, a, uh, he was the worst of the worst, and it says that he was a very short man. He was of short stature. Now, whether he was really short or it was just his perspective, we don't know. I think it was the religious Jews that preached so much law to Zacchaeus that he actually felt small. Because what the law will do, it will, it will make you self-conscious and short in your own eyes. And so it says that he climbed up a sycamore tree. Now the thing that's interesting about a sycamore tree is if you, if you steady it out, a sycamore tree is a type of a fig tree. And a, sycamore, and a fig tree, what's significant about that? What did Adam and Eve try to cover themselves with when they sinned? fig branches. So the fig tree represents self-righteous religion or man-made rules or our dead works. And so because, so, so let's go back. So because of Zacchaeus, his short stature, he climbs up a fig tree, dead in his self-righteous works. And what does Jesus do? He calls up and he says, come down Zacchaeus. I'm going to go to your house today. The simplest altar call and gospel message you'll ever hear right there. Come down, I'm going to your house today. He didn't say you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to pray this prayer. He just said, take me home with you and everything's going to be different. Let me tell you, you bring Jesus Christ into your home, everything changes. Everything. When he comes home with you, man, everything gets better. So Jesus comes home with Zacchaeus. He didn't point out his faults. He didn't deal with his sins. He didn't give him a, you know, a nine-step program to be a reformed tax collector, <laughs> to be a, a better dirty, rotten thief. He ate with him. He embraced him. He loved him. He didn't try to change Zacchaeus. You see that? Jesus didn't try to change Zacchaeus. He came into his home as he was. Man, the religious people got really upset about that. But look what happens next. It says that Zacchaeus stood up. Grace will always cause you to stand up. If the law makes you short, grace makes you tall because it allows you to see yourself the way God sees you and you stand up, you take your place. And of his own free will, he stands up and he says, Lord, if I've taken anything, I will restore back fourfold. Jesus didn't tell him to do that. Jesus didn't say, you got to return everything you've stolen. He'd probably embezzled, you know, thousands, maybe even millions. He was a, made himself a rich man through stealing. And when Zacchaeus encountered the love of God, it so transformed his heart that he wanted to restore back fourfold without Jesus even him telling him he had to do it. Because God's grace always changes the heart. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Not hard pre preaching. Not sin consciousness, not law, not judgment, the goodness of God. 
And then Jesus said these words. He said, today salvation has come to this house. That's God's way. That's the way of grace. That you allow Jesus to come into your life, into your heart, into your home, and you allow him to transform and change things from the inside out. And the result will be a much holier, righteous standard of living than you were ever able to obtain under the law. 